Hello and welcome to Open Your Mind Internet Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And you have myself, Stephen George. Very good evening. Good evening. It's Sunday the 20th of October 2013 and we're back in Studio One. Yes, we are. Welcome back, Steve. It's Thanks been very four much. four weeks since you've been here. It has. That's, that's nearly a month. Yeah, it's nearly a month. Four <laughs> weeks. God, where do you did your math? You must have been good at school. Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh. Okay, uh, guest on tonight is a lady called Karen Huddis who's a World Bank whistleblower, and we'll be talking to Karen shortly, in about 10 or 15 minutes, and we're just going to be catching up on what Karen has been doing, and she's a lady in demand, so we're really excited to have Karen on the show. But before we get there, Steve, can you tell us what the communication channels are? Puppy teeth, then, the communication channels are. Yeah, hang on a second. Mary, it's nice to see you again. You're sitting down there comfortable with the headphones on, the cup of tea. Mary, how can people communicate with us this evening? By the way, Mary's not real. Does everyone know Mary's not real? Here she is. The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046 927 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Thanks very much, Mary, my darling. Uh, 046 927 If you're ringing in from outside the Republic of Ireland, it's 00353 in front of that. And don't forget the OIM chat room as well. We will, monit- we will be monitoring the OIM chat room. That's oimradio.com. Uh, log in on the left-hand side, the live chat button. You can log in and use your real name or your pseudonym. And we'll also be monitoring the MSI. So I'm going to say a big hello to the MSI people tonight as well. Alan. Brilliant. Well, we know Mary is a real person. Her name is not Mary, though. No, it's not. <laughs> and that's all we're going to say. But I christened her Mary. Now, t- uh, Steve, you're going to tell us about last week. Uh, yeah, Seem- seemingly... Um, mm. Uh, there was uh, an email about uh, levels on last week's show, and uh, I'm kind of embarrassed here. But um, mm, yeah, I do. I do want to apologise because, the, uh, as regular listeners will know, I was uh, running the show for the previous couple of weeks, and I had the levels set. I thought they were set nice just for for my level and for the guests coming in through Skype. But it seems. When Alan was in Studio 2 last week and we plugged the other mic in and I made some adjustments on my own little desk, things didn't kind of go to plan and audio levels were a little bit all over the shop. So I do want to apologise for that and uh, if, if anyone uh, you know, had any uh, you know, ear, ear problems uh, listening to podcasts or listening to the live show, I do apologise. Just send your doctor's bills to OIM. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so apologies about that. I think it won't happen again. I think we'll have a return to send a sticker on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, now, but on the, on, the, on the positive side, we got a great email in from one of the listeners, one of our regular listeners regarding Steve. And he said that uh, Steve did a fine job in Alan's absence. It was quite remarkable to actually hear the increase in your comfort level and confidence over the course of those three, three shows. In your third show, you actually did start to sound like Barry White. Barry White. I think we have to call you Paddy White rather than because the Irish version of Barry White. And he goes, no, seriously, your voice was low, slow, and bordering on sultry. <laughs> so, you see, you found your own style and yeah. rhythm. Bravo, yeah. Steve. Well done. Okay. I will, look, I give compliments for compliments to you, and I think Steve did a great job. And... Well, well, okay. well, thanks very much, and I do appreciate that comment. I laughed my head off when I when I read it. Alan forwarded me on the email and I seen it, and uh, I got a good laugh out of it. Um, I, it's amazing how how kind of low your voice can go when there's other people in the other room. Because my where I do the show from, there's a, a glass door, and the other side of that glass door is my wife and my children. <laughs> so you know, it, it's amazing how. Low you can go when you don't want to be disturbing them watching the TV. <laughs> exactly. The late night DJ. Yeah. Okay. Um, you want to tell us about uh, what... Something I want to tell Ashling you. Ashling is up I to. I want to tell you something about... Oh, yeah. Ashling. The girl against fluoride. Hello. Uh, the girl against fluoride. She's inviting you to celebrate the launch of the 2014 Naked Calendar at Film Base in Temple Bar. That's in Dublin, too. It's on Thursday the 7th of November doors open at 6.30pm I will I guarantee there will be a crowd outside I've seen I won't say I've seen some of the pictures well I have seen one of the pictures and uh, it's <laughs> B 
be there. And it's the the again, it's film based Temple Bar Dublin two, Thursday November seventh. Doors open six thirty p.m. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be good, and I think uh, actually on, on a serious note, she is doing wonders for the the fl- the fluoride or the anti fluoride campaign, and I think she deserves all the help she can get. So I mean, if I, if if you can go along, go along. If you can't. At least support her by popping along to her website. I'm, I'm sure they're going to be selling. She's going to be selling these calendars through the website as well. So even if you could buy one for a friend or a family, or just buy one for yourself, it's a worthwhile cause. Exactly. I think that's uh, definitely fair play to Ashley for doing that. Now, just a couple of things uh, left um, to announce. We had a clean out of user accounts on the OAM website. You know, you obviously get spam emails and spam accounts being set up. So we, we, the ones that were not activated or enabled have been cleared. So if all of a sudden you're not getting email from OAM, you just need to re-register and make sure you activate your account. Okay, so just something to do. Just to let you know, just in case if you're not getting any emails to registered users, um, just go back in and register. Now, one more thing we want to make an announcement. We have the missing persons. Now, you know that OAM get involved in the United We Strike Marathon once a month. And there's a lot of very good people on the United Weekly Strike Marathon. And one of these ladies is a lady called Vicky Barker. Now, Vicky Barker, she's a regular on United We Strike, and she also runs a website called UnitedWeLight.com. And she's not been heard of since August. Now, I have the last person she met was a guy called Jay. Jay, this Jay is in Wyoming, and Vicky went to see him, and he posted on her wall, thanks for the visit, sorry I couldn't pay for the coffee, we'll pay next time, and then Vicky is absent without leave. Um, if we don't hear from Vicky shortly, the FBI will be contacted and informed that she is a missing person. It is very important in the truth movement that when something like this happens, that we put aside our differences and work together. For all we know, Vicky might be fine, but for the people that know her, it's out of character for her. So her name is Vicky Barker, and we are trying to track Vicky down at the moment. So just in case anybody hears anything from Vicky Barker, any news, contact ourselves at OIM, and we'll pass on the information over to the, to Karen or Matt at United We Strike, if you can, um, just in case you come across some information. But how was your week, Steve? Yeah, uh, my week's fine. Um, that's that last piece you, you just sp- uh, spoke with about Vicky Barker, that's kind of, it's becoming par for the course now. Anyone kind of stands up really and speaks out, raises their head above the parapet, as they say. And uh, a lot of these people are me- you know, meeting with accidents or they're disappearing, mm. you know. And yeah. it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to happen. And, and that's obviously when, when we get Karen, and that's one of the questions that I, that I have for Karen, you know, because seemingly you do you do something like that you, you have the right intentions and you, you stand out you stand out from the crowd and you do what's right what resonates with, with you and you know b- bad things seem to happen because obviously the, the the powers that be as we 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 commonly refer to them as um you know they they seem to have a lot of pull and can just take people out at will and doesn't even cost them a thought but anyway my week yeah, I actually forgot. Um, I was coming up this evening, and there was a piece of paper on my kitchen table, and I, I, I meant it's one of these things uh, meant meant to bring it with me, but totally forgot. And it was my my father left it for me. I don't know if he's listening, but if you are, I I, I completely forgot the piece of paper. But it was something he had written on it in relation to a lady called Cheryl. Now I don't know. I didn't I didn't get to talk to him this evening, so I'm not sure. If Cheryl is someone he knows, or someone he met, or someone he knows through someone else, I actually don't know. But there was a note on my, on my kitchen table, just basically saying that Cheryl, I think the, she's 68 years of age. It could be 63, 68. I can't really remember. But she she was just giving him some information in relation to the flu vaccine that she has since it's been offered to her. She's never taken it. She knows people who have taken it, and they've become you know fairly sick afterwards. But she's never taken it, and I think we we spoke of the colloidal silver. But that's what that's what he had written down on the note that she makes. Or she does she no she doesn't make it. She actually buys colloidal silver in a in a health food shop, and she uses that anytime she feels a sniff or a sneeze or anything like that coming on or a sore throat. And she's she still gets the flu, but she doesn't get it bad because you know obviously the the, the colloidal silver does the trick and keeps it at bay. But, uh, yeah, I completely forgot that. And, again, I, d- I do apologise. And t- the only other thing that I really want to mention, because I know we want to give maximum time to Karen because she has some great information, is the video that I've seen. I think I, I did post it up on the 
on the chat box. I think if I didn't, I will. It's in relation to some scientist. Uh, I think he's a Spanish scientist. His name is Ferreira, and I can't, I can't pronounce his surname, but he had some great information in relation to what we refer to as Ison, and he referred to it as it was another Spanish name on it, which I'm not going to pronounce or even attempt to pronounce. But he didn't. He said it wasn't a comet. He referred to it as a planet slash comet or a planet comet, because he said it had all the hallmarks of a comet, but due to its size. He was referring to it as a planet. He goes in, it's only a 10 minute video, he goes in, he explains about it. Now this guy, see me, he's been around, he's 90 years of age, he'd done his homework a uh, long, long time ago, and he made some, well I won't say predictions, uh, but I, I don't know what you would say, but he, he put information out there, and he said that there were certain incidents, re-earthquakes that were going to happen, and he, no, it's not Ferrer or Roche, <laughs> but thanks for that. Uh, okay. But yeah, he did make some predictions in relation to earthquakes back in the 60s, and they all came true. He's made other predictions, I think it was about earthquakes, and so on and so forth, up to the 90s. And they've a lot of that information has come to pass. And uh, seemingly, he's, a lot of people are looking at him as the, the guy who seems to know what's going on, has his finger on the pulse, and where NASA are kind of coming up short, they're looking to him. Again, the guy is 90. Uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, hopefully, if time allows, because I know Alan has been looking at other information that kind of, it, it goes against what, what this chap is saying, or it doesn't really complement it anyway. But we're going to talk, well, I suppose we will talk about that later. But other than that, my week, uh, we had a budget in Ireland this week, and again, the old favourites, the alcohol and the cigarettes, they've been, uh, the price has been increased. Uh, I think it's nearly 10 euro. For anyone who smokes, it's nearly 10 euro for a packet of 20 cigarettes over here now. And the beer has gone up and uh, benefits have been cut. Again, it's a, another budget for the rich people and not for the, not for the poor people and certainly not for the young people. So we're going to probably see some more mass emigration. So America, get ready. There's going to be a lot of Irish coming over your way very soon. Alan? Well, why I have to laugh is that you have our Taoiseach, which is our Prime Minister, on about 200 euros a year who hasn't taken a pay cut... 200 euros a year? 200,000 200, euros a year. <laughs> Sorry, 200,000, yeah. 200,000 euros a year. And yet he hasn't taken a pay cut, but he's expecting everybody else to take a cut. I mean, where else would you get it? He needs some money, Alan. You know, where else would you get it? Anyway, um, very quickly, about what I we, what we, we launched on OIM last week, your shout, and a listener said to us, which is quite appropriate, actually, that... We said if anybody had a gripe, they can jump on the soapbox and give us three minutes of an MP3 file. We'll ha- we're happy to ring you or contact you over Skype, a phone call, or if you want to record your own and send it in. But the listener made a point. He said, well, what if I can say, what, can I say something positive rather than something negative? And I, I'm not, we said, yeah, why no, not? No, we don't want positivity <laughs> in this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, so if you want to do something, if you want to do a podcast and have positive information, by all means do. I mean, your show is your show, whatever you want to talk about, as long as you don't use language or don't kind of attack anybody personally, then... Especially us. Yeah, I mean, you can, <laughs> you can do what you want with the government because they're a bunch of bar- parasites anyway, but otherwise. Um, but um, So, yeah, your show, it's a three-minute podcast. You record it yourself, we record it, whatever you want to do, just put it down, and at the end of the shows, we'll allocate three minutes so we can play the podcast. And it just gives you an opportunity to say what you want to say on the podcast, whatever you want to say. So if you want to do that, the email is info at oamireland.com. Send it in to us, and um, that'd be fantastic. Okay, let's crack on. We'll get Karen on, because does, I'm sure we have loads to talk about. Good evening, Karen. How are you? I'm doing great. Brilliant. Karen, thanks a lot for coming on to the show, because... We know you're a lady in demand, and you've been doing loads and loads of interviews. I've seen you on Russia Today with Abby Martin. We've had Abby on the show here as well. And you've been, the information that you've been putting out there and educating people about what's going on has been fantastic. But for people who don't know who you are, do you want to give us a quick bio of who you are, what you did, and, you know, what happened? Happily. I'm a lawyer and an economist who spent 20 years in the legal department of the World Bank. And uh, halfway through, um, 10 years into my working at the World Bank, I saw some corruption going on. 
And I did what a lawyer is supposed to do, which is I went and reported it inside, and I went up the corporate ladder. And then um, I went to the Treasury Department, and then I went to the Securities and Exchange Commission. But the most important thing about me, I think, that people should know is, I, you know, when people are persistent, um, strange things happen when you're reporting um, corruption. They snowball. And so I am now sitting on the world's biggest snowball. And what I did in the process is I involved other whistleblowers inside the World Bank. And particularly, there's um, a Scottish woman named Elaine Colville, and she and I tackled the U.K. Parliament. And I have got two statements up on the U.K. Parliament website. And then in July, both Elaine and I got um, comments up. The uh, inquiry was the, um, let's see if I can remember the name of the committee, it's the Public Administration Select Committee, and their inquiry was complaints. Um, what's the process for handling complaints? And we both took the U.K. Parliament to task. We said, you're doing a terrible job. You know, we've been telling you about this corruption, and you've been sitting on your hands. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it's not a little thing. Um, it's a big corruption. The World Bank is um, its right in the very center of the international financial system, and the rules are very clear in the financial, um, you know, the securities markets, because the World Bank is a very special kind of an international organization. It's, uh, it issues bonds on the capital markets. So if the financial statements of the World Bank are out of whack, you have all kinds of recourse. And the thing about the World Bank um, is it's lots of things. Um, and a lot of people hate it because it's been hijacked. But if you're a lawyer and you know what the rules are and the way it was set up, you can get the World Bank back, back on track. And when you do that, you tackle international corruption. And so um, the other thing about the World Bank is it's a knowledge bank. And um, about uh, in 2004, a political scientist came to the World Bank, and I, I realize now what he was up to. I didn't realize then. I had gone through a lot of education because um, when you're working together with other whistleblowers, they come to you and tell you about hidden things that you didn't know about. And it's not just other World Bank whistleblowers that um, we've been collaborating with. We've been collaborating with um, what they call national security whistleblowers. So there were a lot of hidden things going on in, uh, with the powers that be. And so I've been, you know, every time I hit a certain level, um, I, I sort of have felt through the whole process like I was taking an elevator up. You tackle corruption on one side, and then all of a sudden it turns out there's another hidden layer, kind mm -hmm. of like peeling an onion. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have now <laughs> gone to the most incredible level, and I'm happy to share it with you. And the thing about um, these hidden levels is that it's very difficult to really figure out, to sort, to sort out the information, what's what. There's, a, you know, there's ten times more disinformation yeah. than there is real information. And some of the people that I'm working with have cautioned me. They've said, Karen, you know, you know firsthand about the securities laws because you were involved in that. When you branch out into these other, this other terrain where there's no real proof, you can be discrediting yourself, and that's a risk, but the information is so important um, that I, I just go ahead and I put it out there, and I say, this is what I heard, this is how I heard it, and it may or may not turn out to be true, but I, I wouldn't be telling you if I thought it wasn't true. Okay. So let me, let me end the whole thing with the bombshell, okay? okay? And then we can go back and talk about the stuff that I really know. Okay. The bombshell is that the amount of gold in the world is at least three times what we think it is, and a lot of it is in the vaults of these banks, um, and it's held in a trust for benefit of humanity, you know, and there, there are other, you know, places that the, the gold is supposed to go. But um, so when, when the countries say, oh, our budgets are unbalanced and we need to um, – cut back on benefits to people, et cetera, et cetera, um, they are lying through their teeth.
they are just absolutely um, complicit in trying to wring the last pennies from the people and rip them off. They are unscrupulous. So that's one bombshell. Um, there, there's a whole long story associated with that. I can tell you who I heard this from. Um, I, I ended up working in the Philippines, um, and this is from a German lawyer who's been living in the Philippines, and he's, he sent me the documentation, and it looks very authentic, and it ties in with other things that I know. But uh, let me tell you what happened when I was in the legal department and working in the Philippines. This was at the end of the East Asia financial crisis, um, the end of the 1990s. And um, one of the projects in the World Bank was to strengthen the financial sector, and in particular, the second largest bank in the Philippines, Philippine National Bank, uh, was su supposed to be sold to an independent investor, privatized, yes? Yeah. And uh, what happened was the man who owned uh, Philippine Airlines, Lucy Otan, ended up buying employee stock in Philippine National Bank, which was the second largest bank in the Philippines. And his um, airline company was in default to that bank. And he bought more than 10% of the shares. So that meant that he had to report that to the securities um, regulators in the Philippines, which he didn't bother to do. So he was breaking the law in the Philippines, and he, you know, he had a bank that was in default. Uh, sorry, he had an airline that was in default to that bank. Hmm. So um, the investment advisors it said, by the way, we should not disperse the loan because um, this is this, he's grabbed up the employee stock. That means that we're not going to be able to sell the rest of the shares to an independent investor, they would end up taking a minority interest. So you better warn the uh, country that they're not going to get their money. So I did just that. I wrote a letter that was supposed to be signed by the man in charge of the lending program. I, w I was the lawyer. I was the advisor. So, um, and by the way, I'll tell you all his name. His name was Vinay Bargava. So Vinay Bargava um, didn't send the letter. You know, it said, dear government, you're not going to get your money. Instead, he found some, you know, excuse to have me reassigned. And I didn't like that. I went to the man who was my boss. He was the general counsel of the World Bank. And um, I live on a block where Larry Summers used to live. Larry Summers is the guy that was the secretary of the Treasury, and he was recently supposed to be the candidate that was going to replace Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve. Okay. And, you know, he, he got it. He, Anyway, I can go on and on about Larry Summers, but um, my daughter was in elementary school with his son, and so they would have parent-teacher association meetings, and so I would see Larry Summers regularly, and I went up to him when this problem happened in the Philippines, and I said, you know, there's corruption going on in the Philippines, and the lawyer uh, reassigned me. I had spoken to Larry Summers about the general counsel when the general counsel was just a candidate. I had said, a friend of mine said, oh, um, this guy is about, uh, is one of the uh, candidates for general counsel. Um, he's, he's a good guy. You should have him hired. So I had already said to Larry Summers, this is a good guy. You should have him hired. So this was the man that Larry Summers hired at my, you know, he might have hired him anyway. But I didn't like the fact that Ko Young Tung was moving me out of the Philippines when there was corruption going on. Mm. So I went to, I, I went above Ko Young Tung's head. I went to the Dutch executive director. And I said, this is a man who got hired because I intervened, and now he's dragging me off the Philippines when there's corruption going on. That, that man's name is Peter Steck. And Peter Steck was also the chair of something called the um, Committee on Development Effectiveness to supervise whether the evaluations were accurate. And what happened in the, in the loan for the Philippines later on was that um, the people who had their money on deposit in the uh, Philippine National Bank got nervous because a borrower in default was running the place. So they took their money out, and the government had to bail out the bank for $500 million. And when it came time to disperse the loan, that, you know, that, that – um, Bailout happened after um, we refused to disperse our loan because I went to the decision meeting and, uh, you know, I said to the boss of Vinay Bargava, who was the regional vice president, 
um, I said, if you disperse this loan, I'm going back to the board. And they knew. Yeah, I knew people. I knew a, a lot of the executive directors because I had been there for a long time. Okay. They had wanted me to be the general counsel a number of times. And at one point, I was actually interviewed for the job after all this corruption happened. And they asked me um, why the number of general counsels, you know, it was like a revolving door. You'd have a new general counsel every other year. And I said, it's because if the president doesn't fire the um, general counsel, the board will. <laughs> because the thing about the general counsel position is they're right in the middle between the president and the board. And if they don't know how to play by the rules, they're going to be getting somebody angry, and they're going to end up getting fired one way or the other. Well, That's this, why this, there was such a high turnover. Well, this is anyway, it. so um, the evaluation department, after there was – so we didn't disperse our loan for $200 million. The Japanese had a matching loan, and they didn't disperse their loan for $200 million. So that was $400 million worth of bad loan and $500 million worth of bailout. And when it came time to evaluate the project, the evaluation department said, um, oh, well, it was a satisfactory performance by the World Bank because we could never have figured out that, that this was going to happen with the uh, bank failure. And I went to the evaluation department. And I said, I beg your pardon, but here's the letter that Vinay Bhargava refused to sign, warning the government that they weren't going to get their money. They could have um, required... Lucio Tan to disgorge his shares, and we wouldn't have had this problem. So, no, this was not a satisfactory performance whatsoever. What it was was a cover-up to the board. And you cannot have a cover-up to the board in a, um, you know, a banking institution. So I just sort of hung on to that cover-up, and it's snowballed up all these levels, and it's continued to snowball. And um, when I got fired in retaliation, um, I went to the U.S. Congress, and I kept, once I went to the U.S. Congress, I just kept shoveling information to them. And as the cover-up grew, I went back to the Congress. I said, you didn't solve the problem when I told you to, so here's what's happening now. And um, at one point, uh, Senator Luger wrote three letters to the World Bank saying, don't fire this lady. I mean, I wrote some very pithy letters, which you can read. Um, they're on my website, K-A-H-U-D-E-S dot N-E-T. And you'll see a chronology in there, um, because I, I had just been going up the chain of command in the international financial system. And I have, what I have disclosed is that there is nothing but corruption in the whole entire international financial system because the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are right smack in the um, intersection, in the, mm. in the very center. And the thing that was, you know, what, I, what, what you all were discussing at the beginning, which is how can this lady still be walking around when she's saying these truths? Because other people that have had, um, you know, disclosures that were not as telling um, have – you know, gotten punished, lost their lives. That's right. And the reason why is because I'm a lawyer and I'm talking about the rule of law. And I, it's not like I'm disclosing something that's confidential. It's not like Edward Snowden where they say he stole country secrets. No, I had an obligation as a lawyer to make these disclosures. I was revealing corruption and a cover-up. So anybody who is going to take me on is going to get tangled up in interfering with, um, with corruption. They're branding themselves as corrupt. Okay. So well, nobody wants to do that. Well, of course, it hasn't stopped people from doing weird things. I can tell you all the weird things that have happened. It's been, you know, it's been a real education. But the other thing is that, you know, whistleblowers, um, have a certain personality, and if they didn't have that personality, if they stick with the problem, they develop that personality. And one of the things, you know, people have been asking me, um, you know, because they're kind of curious, what kind of a person gets themselves tangled up in this kind of, you know, story? And the fact of the matter is that I was captain of the NYU fencing team, and I had a Hungarian fencing coach. So as, you know, this, this, this saga has been going on gradually, 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 and I've been kind of um, getting groomed for this 
as the, um, you know, if you go and you look at the chronology, you can see all the different oversight agencies. And, I, you know, I've been looking as a lawyer to see who the agencies are that are supposed to be doing their jobs, and nobody's doing their jobs. So I've been calling out the whole world. And the way the securities laws work is um, look at the United States. There are 50 states, and there's something called blue sky securities laws. So any investor, anybody who holds a World Bank bond in any of the states is supposed to be protected by the governors and the attorneys general in those states. So I have had, you know, I've been um, corresponding with all of these oversight agencies and all of the 188 countries that are members of the World Bank, those World Bank bonds are in those countries um, and the securities laws are broken in those countries. So all of the ministers of finance have an affirmative obligation to protect me. And the, the main explanation for how this, this whole thing is developed is because um, there's a very, very good um, tool in political science um, using game theory modeling. And um, the political scientist who developed this, he actually developed, developed it in the Department of Defense. And then he came to the World Bank, and um, we used it in Ghana to try to see why a law wasn't getting passed. And then I said, would you give me a freebie? Would you let me run rule of law using your model? And he did. And that, that um, analysis is very, very accurate. It, if you're um, okay. looking, Karen, looking can compare I, the track record. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just jump in there? That, there's a lot of information there, what you just said, brilliant information. What I'd like to try and focus on, Karen, is we're trying to, we're trying to have a look at the Irish situation, if possible. We, I mean, I think... We totally know where you're coming from regarding the what we call the cabal and the whole system being corrupt. That's definitely a given, and we can completely um, accept the fact with the way the system is corrupt, the way it's been set up. Even the fractional reserve banking system, it's it's all corruption. What we would like to find out, if you do have any information on it, is you know what really started causing the problems over here in Ireland was the bank bailout in 2008. And obviously the Irish banks, uh, or I would say the Irish government, agreed to cover all debts. And that's really when, you know, everything kind of started to go downhill. We'd like to get your opinion on what you felt happened at that time or what information you have regarding that. And obviously the bailout and what's going on now regarding Ireland. Yes, I can explain why that happened. Because there were a lot of things that were going on at the World Bank that I couldn't understand. And what the, the short answer to your question is something called state capture, which is to say the people that were supposed to be protecting Ireland had been captured by the corruption in the center of the financial system. And I will describe that corruption the way I understand it. But first, let me just finish what I was talking about, about that um, game theory analysis, because it's very important that you understand that we've won. And you won't understand it if you don't understand about this game theory model. Okay. It's 90 to 95% accurate. It models the politics of the international financial system. And I did a model just of internally in the World Bank, but the political scientists who came to the World Bank had modeled the world. And so there's a transition in power going on between the West and the East. And the question is whether we're going to resolve that transition by a war or whether it's going to be gradual using the rule of law. We've never had a gradual, peaceful transition in power at the center of the world. And that's what we're trying to do. It's never been done before. But we're using this, uh, this model. That's what's going on. And so I was able, using the model, to um, – one of the people that I spoke to in the U.S. Congress is the man who is now the – um, Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel. He was senator from Nebraska. And I t spoke to him about the model in 2008, the same year that you're talking about with Ireland. What I said to him was um, this corruption at the World Bank, because at that time I didn't know that it was part of this whole – I didn't know how corrupt the international financial system was. I was just talking about the World Bank. And what I said to him – was that this model was predicting that we were going to lose our ability to appoint the president of the World Bank. And that absolutely happened 
in 2010. There was another inexplicable thing that happened that I didn't understand in 2009. That's the year after Ireland had this, um, uh, what, whatever you want to call it, unfair um, well, the signing on to debts that were odious. That's right, Jack. What happened in 2009 was um, how to describe this. Um, the best way to describe it is um, just to say what happened. Uh, no. Let, let's talk about this espionage that's going on where we found out that everybody's phones are being tapped, including the, um, the countries. And so, for example, uh, Germany has now said that they are not going to share intelligence information with the U.S., this is a very big thing. And don't forget, Germany also asked to get its gold back at the beginning of this year. And the Federal Reserve said, no, we're not going to give you back your gold uh, for seven years. That is an act of war. Now, when I spoke to Chuck Hagel in 2008, what I said to him was that this very accurate model was predicting that if the U.S. did not play by the rules, that we were going to lose something called the Gentleman's Agreement, which is that the U.S. can appoint the president of the World Bank just – you know, without any need to um, get that approved. And I said, we're going to lose that ability. And that's what happened in 2010. I had actually warned the Treasury Department in 2007 that this was going to happen. So then, um, I, and I was fired in 2007, um, but I had been there for 20 years. I'm a rather senior person, so I had a, a big enough pension, and I was curious enough to see what was going to happen. And I kept thinking that things were going to resolve themselves uh, very quickly. And, you know, we're still dragging on. But um, I hadn't understood the depth of the corruption and what I was up against. And as this has gone, you know, forward, I'm getting, I mean, think, I'm giving all kinds of analogies. But think that somebody has um, swallowed barium, and then you can see when you have an MRI, you can see the whole image. Mm. So because of this corruption that me and the other whistleblowers have been reporting, it's been a diagnosis of the extent and the depth of the corruption in the international financial system. And one of the, one of the things that I didn't understand in the very beginning and that I understand very well now is what role the media plays or doesn't play. Because when I did the model, I thought I gave a role to the media and I gave it a positive role and I found out that that was absolutely incorrect. It turns out, what is this corruption? The corruption is that there, we, you know, you were re referring to it as the cabal. This, um, these private entities have bought up, um, there's a very accurate study done by the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. They looked at the ownership data of 43,000 transnational companies, and they found out that there's a super entity. You look and you see the big banks and you think they're separate. They're not. They're all interconnected. It's all one conglomerate. Yeah. And the, the Federal Institute of Technology calls it the super entity. So the reason that Ireland swallowed the debt of the banks is because this super entity has that amount of power that they can reach into the political system of all these countries and co-opt them so that instead of representing their citizens, those politicians – the, the gatekeepers, you know them well, you were mentioning some of their names, they are in the service of the super entity. Now, some of these people are patriots, and they were um, using this uh, technology. They Private information was discovered, and they're being blackmailed. Some of them are being bribed. Some of them are afraid for their family members. I mean, you know the, the, the way this super entity operates. Yeah. But let me tell you what I found out um, from the board of executive directors that I was telling the countries. Um, I speak Dutch because I studied economics at the University of Amsterdam. I went to Yale Law School, but I, as I said, I'm also an economist. And so I happened to be in Holland, and I speak Dutch, and the man who was representing the Dutch government on the board of the World Bank, Herman Weifels, and Herman Weifels was a very senior politician. He had formed the Dutch government. He was complaining in the press that the executive directors were being blackmailed when they were trying to fire Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz came from, you know, the, the um, Department of Defense. He's what they call a neocon. 
and, and he, when Paul Wolfowitz became the president of the World Bank, there was a woman, um, Shaha Riza, who was his girlfriend, who worked in the World Bank, and he gave Shaha a nice 35% raise. And the board fired Paul Wolfowitz, but before the board finished firing him, the board was um, threatened. They were told that any of the members of the board who went to something called the New York Madam, that's the same business establishment where Elliot Spitzer, who was the governor of New York, and Elliot Spitzer was fighting some of the corruption in Wall Street. So Elliot Spitzer, you know, the United States, they're rather um, uh, moralistic, and if somebody's going to um, a business establishment like uh, the New York Madam, that person's career is over. So Elliot Spitzer's career isn't totally over, but he had to resign as governor. And some of the executive directors who were patronizing the New York Madam were told if they voted to um, fire Paul Wolfowitz, that information would be made public. Now, the board went ahead and fired Paul Wolfowitz. Um, but in, in Holland, getting back to Holland, after Herman Vankels, um made that uh, disclosure in the press, the next day there was a television show where Ad Melkert, who had been the predecessor um, representing the Dutch government on the board, um, Ad, Ad Melkert had then gone to the United Nations Development Program. And so they interviewed Ad because Ad was also um, involved. He had been on the ethics committee in the board. Um, so the, the Dutch television program asked Ad whether he was also uh, being blackmailed. And Ad said, I'm a boring guy. But um, I knew other executive directors who were telling me just how upset they were at being threatened for firing Paul Wolfowitz. Now, I knew when Paul Wolfowitz came to the World Bank that we were in for a difficult time because before I joined the World Bank legal department, um, I, I made it my business to um, get to know a, a senior lawyer who had retired. He was the longest-serving general counsel. His name was Aaron Brochus. And Aaron had told me, he, you know, he gave me like the operation manual for the World Bank. He had been there when the treaty for the World Bank was negotiated in 1944 with 44 countries. And so he knew where all the bells and whistles were. And he said, the legal department of the World Bank is really the most powerful position inside the World Bank because you are sitting there and mediating between the presidency and the rest of the board. So I knew how important that job was. And, and he said the World Bank started to go to hell when um, uh, Robert McNamara came to the World Bank in 1968. When the Pentagon starts running the World Bank, that's when you have to fasten your seatbelt as a lawyer mm -hmm. in the World Bank. So I was there waiting for Paul Wolfowitz to show up. And when he, you know, when all of that happened, and when I found out what happened with um, the, this threatening the board, I went ballistic. I wrote the dean of Yale Law School. I had been looking at that accurate stakeholder analysis, and it was, you know, all the alarms were going off. It was telling me that we were headed to a currency war. At well, that point, well, if we didn't get rule of law. And then I went to the Senate, and the Senate said, um, go to the Treasury Department. So I went to Kenneth Peel in the Treasury Department, and then I've been writing the Senate Intelligence Committee. And now, when Germany, um, not only uh, we had this problem with gold, but a couple of weeks ago, there was a military helicopter that buzzed the U.S. consulate and broke all the China in, in the um, consulate. And so I went back to my friend Chuck Hagel inside the Department of Defense. I said, you know exactly what this means. This means we are losing all of our allies. Mm. Well, we have got to get rid of this corruption. We have absolutely no choice. Yeah. And I've not just been writing to Chuck Hagel, but in the Department of Defense, there's a special um, uh, secre assistant secretary of defense who liaises with Homeland Security, and there are 10 governors who are on a special uh, committee of governors, and the, one of the co-chairs of that committee is my governor of Maryland, Martin O'Malley. So, I, you know, I've been writing all of them, and every time something happens that looks really bad, I go back to them and I say, what on earth do you guys think you're doing? 
And then I turn around and share it to all the people that are reading my Facebook page. Okay. And at one point, well, Karen, can um, I, can I got can so mad. Can I mean, you... I've been writing all of the embassies many, many times. There's also something called the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies. It's a big, long word. But what it is is all of the different um, economic entities in the United States, so the chairman of the SEC, uh, Ben Bernanke, the chairman of uh, the Fed, um, you name it, Agency for International Development, Commerce. Um, I used to work at the Export-Import Bank. The chairman of Exim Bank is on it. Um, who else? The special trade representative. Anyway, well, Karen, the Karen, NAC, Karen can, I, can I just jump in there? Can we, yeah. can, can we just kind of focus on the Irish thing for a minute? Because that's really what our interest is at the moment and what went on with the banks and the bailout. That's really, we, we, we know we kind of do the global thing with OAM, but obviously we are located in Ireland and we have an interest in what's happening with the bailout and the banks and the politicians over here. So if we could focus more on that, because the, we do have questions coming in from our listeners and they're, they're obviously questions in relation to that. So if we could focus more on that, that would be fantastic. If we could um, kind of talk about what happened with the banks with Bailo and basically what's happening now. I mean, I'd personally like to know what, you know, what the st- situation is with the air politicians. Why, you know, what, you know, what do the cabal have on air politicians? Have they blackmailed them? Have they threatened them? You know, what's going on there? Of course, there? that's how they work. Mm, that's, yeah. Of course they've done that. Yeah, well, basically what we want to, and obviously the other question that we have, we have a, a, a few listener questions coming in, but we all know about the fractional reserve banking system, and we have said time and time again, the, the, the euro was set up to lose, you know, to, to fail, basically. And I don't know why we got rid of our own currency. Iceland are doing fantastic at the moment. And what people have said is, we know this is a fractional reserve system. This money doesn't exist. You know, banks pull it out of thin air, they stick it on the computer, and because they have the license to do it, they make it legal tender, and that's it. And then they charge usury interest on top of that. So we know that all this is a, you know, it's a, it's a whole scam. Mortgages, you know, people getting evicted from the homes, banks saying we're going to give you money for your mortgage when that money doesn't exist. There's big fights on in Ireland at the moment regarding, you know, we're challenging the banks over here. And so any information you can give us regarding the legality of the banking system and what the banks are up to and how we can use something that you may know to help us take on the banks, then that would be fantastic if you have anything like that. Yes, I certainly do, and I'm so glad you're going to be there and take advantage of it. The first thing to do is to go to Hungary and see what they've done. Yeah? Okay. They've extricated themselves. That's a good example to follow. And... uh, You're absolutely right. The Federal Reserve and the Bank for International Settlements is nothing but a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam, and the American citizens are now aware of this, and it's not going to continue. It's not going to continue one way or another because of what's going on in the gold markets. Mm. People are losing confidence in that paper currency. There has Mm. never been a fractional reserve fiat currency that has gone on without failing, and we're now, you know, with, with the United States as the reserve currency, that's not going to continue. No. We've got these BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, that have now set up their own competing development bank, and they have decided that they're no longer going to finance their international trade with U.S. dollars. That's 25% of international trade. They're going to settle the difference. They're going to have offsets, like barter, and then... At the end, if you know it's not going to come out even, and there's going to be a, a need to make the net payment, they're going to use gold for that. Okay? Right. So this is notice to the United States that their dollars are not um, as they con- as they are now constituted, issued as Federal Reserve notes, where you're paying interest. But that's not the way countries have to have currency. They can have currency issued by their own treasury. Well, they won't do it. See, the problem is over here, Karen, as you know, our, um, our politicians are controlled. And we know, you know, what's, ho- what's happening over here, we know the banks, I mean, somebody's just said on the chat room there um, that one of our banks, which is Bank of Ireland, apparently didn't have a license to trade. 
and we're finding all these legalities um, completely wrong with the way the banks are operating over here. And I know we had a, a group called Debt Options. There's over a thousand people taking on the banks over here in Ireland. So what we're looking for is from a legal standpoint is what do we need to do to challenge the banks? Can you tell us from a, a legal point of view how, as a man on the street, what we can start, what, what we need to do, even as a group of people, to challenge the banks and ask them to prove X, Y, and Z? What do we need to do? Okay, I've got just the answer for you. We've already won. You simply have to declare victory, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. All right? Okay. Um, this, this stakeholder analysis I was telling you about, it's all about forming coalitions, and the coalitions have formed that are stronger than the cabal. Okay, that's good news. Yeah, yeah. and that's why, that's why Russia Today TV put me, you know, I've been on there twice. First I had a seven-minute interview, and then uh, just before the annual meetings that concluded on the 13th of October, just before those meetings concluded, uh, Russia Today TV had a half-hour interview that they put on and they ran four times. Okay? Okay. So, um, and I've been, as I was um, starting to say, the uh, a business website in Germany had an article um on what I'm telling you about, uh, which when I was, you know, when they were editing it, they made sure that I, that I uh, focused on this problem about the military helicopter buzzing the consulate. Mm. And then they said, what does this mean? And so I had, to, I had to look it up to see what it meant. It meant, according to one of the German officials, it was a shot across the bow. Now, this has got to be alarming the United States. Department of Defense. And so I went to them. I said, I told you so. You see that stakeholder analysis, which is 90 to 95% accurate. Do you want to lose your ally? Is that what you think is protecting national security? You have a choice to make. Either you deal with your duty for protecting this country, or you be corrupt for the cabal. Here's your choice. And I'm putting this choice, this very clear choice, out on my website. Hmm. So, obviously, if I'm educating the public in the United States, and I'm starting to get through, the reason why I did not get through is because the cabal bought up the media. That's, you know, that's the main thing. Hmm. But if you're, if you're looking for a positive sign, look what happened in Syria, where it was clear that what the cabal had in mind was World War III. That was going to be the trigger event. It didn't happen because people knew that they were being lied to by the media. Yeah. So, so you now have a – we've decoupled ourselves from the mainstream media. One of the most important tools that the cabal had, which was to misinform the public, isn't working anymore. We've got the Internet. We've got the alternative media. We have cases which very clearly demonstrate to the public that their officials are listening to the cabal, not the interests, not the national interests. And going back to Ireland – in your case, when that odious death was accepted instead of repudiated, like what happened in Ireland, that shows you. Now, that, that happened in 2008. That's before this coalition gelled. Okay. But you now have this coalition. It's there. And what you can do is you can hold your politicians to account. The first thing that I should do is I should show you all the letters that I have been writing to the U.K. executive director who represents you on the board of the World Bank. And, I, and you know, um, I, I know there's um, a question about to what extent the U.K. parliament is serving the interests of Ireland. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to say that. I said that's what I was just going to say. Why, why do we have a, a U.K. representative when we are a, a separate country, apparently? Well, I've also testified in the European parliament in uh, May of 2011. So it's clear that, that you can um, take advantage of that testimony. And what happened? What did the UK Parliament do when I testified? I gave them a very detailed chronology that you'll see up on my website. And the UK Parliament sent that, the legal department of the UK Parliament sent that back to the World Bank for comment. The World Bank never commented. So this is a cover-up of corruption. And the people in Ireland are buying World Bank bonds 
when the financial statements of the World Bank are inaccurate. So you can go to your securities regulators and you can say that um, you want to get accurate financial statements but of the, the World Bank and there's no way you're going to get them until this corruption has been resolved. But the problem with that, Karen, is that our financial regulator now was asleep at the wheel and if not, he was part of the golden circle and the, the, the financial regulator is a central bank. I mean, they're, they're all controlled, Karen, so you can't really go to these people because they're all part of the same cabal, they're all part of the same group. And this is why people are getting evicted from the homes and they're, they're, they're um, being kicked out on, onto the street because of these evictions taking place all illegally. And we have a constitution, unlike a lot of countries, and in our constitution it says they can't do that and they're blatantly ignoring it. But yet we can see... The banks getting away with blue mortar time and time again. The government just kowtowing to exactly what the banks want to do. And corporatism, because there's corporate companies involved with an interest as well. And they're, the, the politicians are just bending over backwards and doing everything they, they, um, they're told to do. And we can see this blatantly. Yet, there's nobody in the Irish government that we can see. We have independent politicians who are very good, but they don't have any power. But the main three parties that are, are, are there, they're all bending over backwards, they're all kowtowing to what they're told, and nobody has any... Uh, I was going to say something rude there, but Leroy D is an Irish word for the same thing. <laughs> they don't seem to have any uh, backbone at all. They're all spineless. Um, and obviously they're being either threatened or blackmailed or whatever, whatever it is that, that's going on. And... Um, the country, like most countries around the world, are in austerity and we're having major issues, major problems. And okay, I can, I, can, I can give you the game changer, Gus. I don't mean to interrupt, but I can give you the, the game changer. And first of all, be very grateful that you do have honest politicians. You can go to them and you can give them the information that I'm giving you and they can hold the other politicians to account because what is happening is there has been a game change. There has been a major shift. You can see some of these, these things going on as we speak. It wasn't just Syria, but another game changer is that Saudi Arabia refused its seat on the uh, Security Council in the United Nations. So a number of countries are recognizing that there's going to be a different order. And I can tell you what the pivot point is. The pivot point is the fact that the paper currencies are not strong enough. And there's something called gold backwardation. That's a fancy word for people losing confidence in the paper currencies. Mm. So what's happened in July was that central banks like to lease their gold. They can't lease their gold anymore. On the 7th of July, it became too expensive to pay the, you know, the premium for the, the lease because it was too risky. Um, the, and this threat of gold backwardation, the technical word that the traders use is GOFO, and GOFO became negative, so they couldn't lease the gold anymore. And the last time GOFO became negative, this was in 1971, when the United States went off the gold standard and mm -hmm. would not give gold in return for dollars anymore. So we, we are now on notice, and if you look at how many people are buying U.S. Treasuries as opposed to how many people are selling them back to the Federal Reserve. The, the United States um, Federal Reserve is no longer viable. They had expected that they were going to be able to um, get permission to go into a world currency, and that ha permission didn't happen. Just the opposite. And the people in the United States know. They're watching now. And so the Federal Reserve System is not going to continue much longer. The, the real question is, how kind of, what kind of a transition is this going to be? And what should people do in the middle of the transition? Um, and I'm hopeful that it's going to be a smooth transition, but I certainly have no way of guaranteeing it. But the, the one thing I do know is that with the alternative media, like, and I have to thank you again um, for putting me on your show. I mean, it's great to be here with OYM Ireland. No problem. Um, Glad to have you on. But, but anyway, so as, as the world trades information and the Internet um, helps us to solidify our relationship, we will be able to hold hands and kick those corrupt bankers out. But what I was going to tell you is um, 
what's what I you know I was telling you about this elevator going up. I have to tell you what's behind the um, Bank for International Settlement and these corrupt bankers because that's not the top level of the corruption. There's another level. Are you ready for that? Go ahead. Did you ever hear of the Jesuits? Yep. That's the biggest corporation mm. and the Jesuits. Goes back the, to the Vatican. These, these bankers, this this fiat banking system, mm. this is um, coming from the Jesuits bankers. Yeah. Okay? So, now, let me tell you what happened with, um, with Pope Francis. He doesn't go into his apartments. It's not because he's a humble pope. It's because of what happened to his predecessor who stepped down. It wasn't because of ill health. He was found guilty of child trafficking. And are you ready for this? Go on. So was Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, well, we, we, are, we had uh, um, guests on before, and they've actually named names and said things and people that have been involved in child trafficking and uh, child abuse and pedophilia. And uh, that's been a big expose on what we've talked about on the show before. So that doesn't actually surprise me. Now, Ratzinger was the first pope to step down that was alive. And I know Kevin Arnett and his group are um, attacking the, the Vatican on, on that side because... Yes, I met, I met uh, Kevin uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, well, Kevin's been on the show a couple of times. And yeah. um, he's he's been exposing what's going on in the Canadian schools, and we've talked to Kevin about that. And um, yeah, I, I mean the the level that this goes up is is phenomenal, and it goes back even you know like I've read information about um, uh, the Vatican and McKinkis, uh, Calvi, Sedona, and all these people involved with what the Vatican uh, is doing, and the Vatican uh, Bank, and um, and you know the history says says itself it's 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 out in the media you can read about it but as you say the the media itself is controlled and while people are sitting in front of their tv watching all the kind of brain brain damage tv that's just completely worthless the media is controlled but what i'd like to find out is that over here we are um there are there is people getting together they are beginning to fight the banks and attack the banks and ask questions and obviously, we obviously we know where a lot where a lot of the problems are. On as you say, the Jesuits are one of the groups involved, and just the, the Illuminati families as well, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and you know we we are aware of that. And um, what How about we, the black nobility? Exactly. Yeah. Well, they, there you go. That's another group. I mean, there's there's so many groups involved with the and this this goes up. This is why we have the pyramid, and it goes up and up and up and up. Um, and if you keep like going to the top, going to the going to the top, you um you know God knows who's at the very top. I don't know. You know. Okay, well let me tell you what I know. Mm. Yes. Because yeah, as my story has gotten out, people have contacted me. So one of the people that contacted me is uh, a German lawyer who knows. The, see what what the the nobility has done is they have taken their wealth. And they've concentrated it, and they've put it in secret deposits, in a secret uh, trust account. And this German lawyer, see, um, the nobility is all interconnected as well. And so this um, German lawyer sent me um, a long list of the pedigree of the nobility. And did you know that Hitler was a close cousin of your Queen Elizabeth? Oh, yeah. Well, they, they, we know that the Queen is German. Um, Go, uh, Gothenburg. Is it Gothenburg? Yeah, sorry. She's not, just, just to clarify, she's not our Queen. Well, not our, Bri sorry. The British, the British, the British Queen. queen. Um, yeah, right. she, she, yes, they changed the I name. That's my fault. That's why. In any event, um, so these, these um, nobles are, uh, this information, as it becomes more and more public, their legitimacy is eroding by the day. And as we're able to show how they've been um, siphoning money from the public and, and from Ireland through, through this odious debt mm. and, and confiscation of the homes, it becomes less and less tenable. And this, getting back to the stakeholder analysis, here is the best part, I think, and that is that um, the U.S. has got to choose. Do they want to be all by themselves? with no international currency, or do they want rule of law 
in which case what we will have is we will have an alliance with Russia, with Germany, using rule of law, and the likelihood that that is what we end up with is 95%. So these, you know, this little system of um, pick on the, the citizens and, uh, and grab all of their money isn't going to continue. It's just not going to continue. And let me tell you what, um, what I know about how much gold is on deposit in these banks because this uh, German lawyer told me that there's 170,000 or 170, 500,000 metric tons of gold in a vault in the Bank of Hawaii, 130,500 metric tons in Amex Hong Kong, and 150,000 metric tons of gold in Development Bank of Singapore for a total of 451,000 metric tons. And then there's an additional 100,000 metric tons in American banks. And there's also some gold buried in the Philippines. It used to be buried, um, they had the Japanese soldiers, uh, you know, there's been so many atrocities. Yeah. They had Japanese soldiers dig um, tunnels and they buried the soldiers and the gold together. And then after a while this um, terrible grave, mass grave, was dug up and they took that gold that was buried. Yamashita, he is also one of these nobles that was... See, what happened was, do you remember um, Queen Victoria? She actually had a twin brother who was autistic. That's right. And yeah. so they sent him off to the Philippines. Mm. And he, um, he was a gadabout and he went around the world having affairs. And he had an affair in Japan... And that's who Yamashita was. He was descended from this um, this prince, this UK prince. Anyway, um, if anybody's interested in these pedigrees, um, I can give you the uh, description of this from that I got from this German lawyer. Um, but in any event, so there is so much gold, and it's it's supposed to come out and be, and benefit humanity. Some of it can underpin the um, currencies so that we don't have to pay interest on them. Mm. And, and the terms of this, um, this trust, where the gold is held in this trust, is that it's to benefit humanity. Yeah. And so what happened when, um, when the queen was deposed and when the pope was, I don't know what you do to a, a pope, you don't defrock them, but in any event, when he lost his seat, um, that was when the International Court of Justice delegated the right to prepare projects that were going to be funded by the trust fund gold. And I found the name of the person who's supposedly responsible for um, preparing these projects, and I said, who, you know, who told you to do this in, in secret? And the answer that I got was, why don't you prepare a project and we'll fund that one too? Wow, okay, that's interesting. Yes, that's very interesting. So if people learn about this and can hold these secret arrangements out for a little bit of sunshine, you're, you know, the people in Ireland are not going to have to make do with their houses being repossessed by these banks. These banks have lost it. They no. are no longer, their, their uh, fiat currency is not viable, and the, the replacement currencies will be underpinned by the world's goal. That's what it's for. But they're, ins they're, they're insolvent at the moment. I believe where the banks over here in Ireland are insolvent anyway. That's right. So, so you know, the question, where do things stand? Um, I can tell you what happened at the annual meetings. Um, I've been telling the board that they should no longer accept uh, Dr. Jim Kim, who's the current president of the World Bank. They should no longer accept that... Dr. Jim Kim is just going to decide everything and the board can vote it up and down. That the board needs to take back its, its powers. And I said that the first thing the board needs to do is to fire uh, a company named Allied Barton that provides the security guards for the World Bank. I said they're not listening to you and you're the ones who are in charge of this. You're the ones who should be deciding what happens to this gold. Not the president of the World Bank. You know, he's, he's lost all credibility. If you don't want to fire him, just ignore him. 
Um, that's where things are. So they wouldn't let me in to the annual meetings that, that just concluded October 13th. And the last time I tangled with the meetings, that was in April, and what happened was Eric Holder arrested me, threw me in jail. <laughs> wow. Yes. And then, um, so they ended up releasing me, and then um, I got the case dismissed, and I'm trying to get the judge who um, refuses to have my arrest record sealed, I'm trying to have her removed from the bench. And I've gone to all the sheriffs in the country, uh, and one of the things that are, that's going on in the, in the United States is there's a provision in the Constitution of the United States that says that the citizens can fire their government. It's consent of the governed. So what, uh, what happened, and I didn't know about this, as the story goes out, people come to me with their stories, and it turns out that there's a fellow who has devoted his entire life to going around and getting the state legislatures to request a constitutional convention. And um, the, you have to have two-thirds of the states do this. And it actually already happened. Uh, Wisconsin was the state, I think it was the 34th or the 35th state. And then um, they wrote a nasty letter to the Congress saying, you have no choice, you're required under the Constitution to call a constitutional convention. What on earth do you think you're doing? And, you know... It, it met silence, and I've, I've sort of seized on that, and I've said, we absolutely have the right to fire Congress because look what they're doing with the Federal Reserve Bank. Look what they nearly did. You know, they, they uh, the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations uh, was all prepared for us to ha start having World War III uh, in Syria. So what, what is, what's going on now is that the government is totally discredited, and, and furthermore, we, we can point to provisions of our Constitution that give the citizens the right to take the government back. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, where it's a federal system, we, we can govern ourselves by the states. We can ignore the federal government. We can just, um, just totally ignore them. They, yeah. they lost all right to govern. But you know, the, the, that's not going to yeah. happen, Karen. We know, you know that because they'll have the, the, the FBI or the IRS or the, the local um, uh, goon squad knocking on your door saying you're disobeying the law and you'd be arrested. It's, it, you know, it's the same over here. You know, you know at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we are trying to do what we can do. Um, regarding the law, but unfortunately, uh, what we call the police over here is called the Gardaí. They're not educated in the law. They're just told what to do. And they're told to go out and arrest this person, and arrest that person. And they just say, well, and we're just doing their jobs. It's the old Nuremberg excuse, you know? Um, but it's a little different here, because um, don't forget that you are now being told about a coalition. You've got 188 ministers of finance backing you for a different system. There's a different system going on here. We have we have fired the Bank for International Settlements. Can we fire the banks over here? That'd be great. I'll tell you, Karen. But they have been fired. We but just simply have to get ourselves um, aware of the fact and and how to get it implemented. It's not a question of whether they're still um, legitimate. Can we they get are can not we, legitimate. Can we get a letter? It's illegitimate. Can we get a letter off you? stating this fact so we can send it to the banks or send it to the central bank saying you're fired, you shouldn't be in this country, you, you're, you're trading insolvent, you don't have a license to trade, and you are now fired. And I'll tell you what I'll, what I'll forward to you, and I'm going to put it up on my Facebook page, and this is the letter that I wrote to, um, it's called GATA, um, which is it's an NGO that uh, oversees the gold industry. And I've you know, I've just told them about all of this gold and the fact that it's supposed to be applied to the benefit of mankind and that it needs to be applied to the currencies before they fail. There's yeah. no question about the, the, the fact that people have lost confidence in them. Well, yeah. well, so it's not so much it's not so much a legal letter as an economist's letter. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. The, the currencies, the fiat currencies are not... People have lost confidence in them. That's what this um, gold backwardation means. And it's absolutely essential for the world not to go into a system where it's permanent gold backwardation. That would mean 
you couldn't finance international trade, you'd have pestilence, you'd have a breakdown in law and order. So we do not, ha we're not obligated to sit here and wait until um, there's a calamity. It's obviously, ob it's obvious that we have to switch currencies and we have to do it right now and we have to use the world's gold. And if the citizens know about this and demand it, yeah, I can write a, a draft letter for, for people in Ireland to, to um, sign and help draft, you know, ask the, the GATA to help with drafting it. I think that would be a great thing to do. Okay, well, that would be brilliant to do that. We just have a problem where our stream, I think we're back up on the OAM stream, just went down for a few seconds. And we just yes, back you see, up I there. told you we would have this. Yeah. I told you we would have this. this. These things do happen. Uh, right, Karen, we have um, a whole load of questions that's come in, and I'm, look, and I'm looking at the time. So what we're going to do is we'll do a quick hit question. So we throw a question at you. If you can answer it within a sentence, that would be great, and we'll get through all the questions. How and many questions do you have so I know how to pace myself? Right. We have about many questions you have there, Steve. Uh, six. Good, so all six. Well, okay. Okay, and how much time do we have? Right, we have about uh, 30 minutes, but we'll have more questions coming in. And we'll and we'll also to probably want to talk about some other things at the end, so let's... Yeah, yeah. so let's just do a yeah, quick yeah. fire, yeah, if we can. Okay, Steve, over to you. Okay, just, uh, Carolyn, in relation to what we were just speaking about earlier, uh, well, seconds ago, um, it, I think that's kind of a good time to throw in this question that we have here. Uh, in, uh, we're talking about solutions, and you're saying you're going to give us some information that, that from your own personal experience that we could use. Um, what's your opinion or your thoughts on what the OPPT seem to be doing? Uh, a lot of people are saying it's good. Some people are criticising them. Um, and one of our listeners here says uh, that that he thinks that you know the, the OPPT. Uh, people criticise Karen for trying to reform the World Bank, but uh, our listener seems to think that you're more of a realist than the OPPT. Okay. Um, the OPPT and I are in agreement about the problem, which is to say that um, they have corporatized people. And, for example, in the United States, when a baby is born, they issue a bond on the capital market because they say that baby is going to grow up and earn money. Now, and then what happens is when you go into the courts in the United States, they are no longer courts of common law. They're maritime courts. They consider their citizens to be ships. This is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. And OPPT understands that um, ridiculous situation, but we part ways in terms of how to resolve it. My, um, what I'm doing is you've heard I'm working together using the existing um, governance structure in the international financial system, which is to say, as a bondholder, I'm demanding accountability for accurate financial statements. And that is open and shut. That is me as a trained Yale Law School lawyer. If OPPT doesn't like my approach, I'm terribly sorry. I, I stand by it. Okay, we just had a, another glitch on the player, and it's come back up again there. Sorry. Um, you're right, Karen. They they just don't like to hear the truth. They just don't like to hear the truth coming out, Steve. Well, the truth the truth hurts sometimes. Yeah, we uh, for anyone who who is missing part of the show due to the stream going down. Remember, we are on other streams as well, which you can find on our homepage, oamradio.com. And uh, if you've missed any parts of the show, it will be available on the podcast immediately after we finish. Now we'll continue on the questions. Uh, this question came in earlier, Karen, and it's from Sam. Sam was wondering, can you ask Karen if it's worthwhile uh, us less fortunate folks uh, buying silver coins? You know, I am asked these questions all the time. Um, I think as insurance, because if the fiat currencies go down, you want to be able to buy food and other necessities, and people will recognize silver. But in terms of a long-term invest investment, if all of this, you know, precious metals that's on deposit comes out, it may be, you know, demand and supply. Who knows where the price will end up? But I think we'll all be richer if we get all of the, the world's treasures out there to be applied for all of the world's people. So I'm not worried. Um, I think, so to answer your question, yes or no, yes, buy silver. Okay, and this is a, a question that came up be a, a long time ago. I think we, we actually had 
Uh, as someone mentioned earlier in the guest book or the chat room, uh, Pastor Lindsay Williams, we had him on a couple of times. And uh, he, he was recommending sometimes to buy silver uh, as opposed to gold. And what, What's your thoughts? I mean, would any precious metal do or what, what, would you have any favoritism, say, gold or silver? Well, some people say silver is more underpriced. Um, silver is not as expensive as gold. Silver is better to use for purchases. But some people say that gold is not as volatile, so it's a better store of value. But I, I just want to say something about past, Pastor Lindsay Williams, and that is go to a website called Wiki Spooks. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with that website, but I, I, I do know we, we have had him on. He has given us inf- information. Like, I'm not going to say whether it's been good information or bad information. It's just been information that's kind of... Uh, it's already out there in the public domain, if you like, and I think he puts his, his own spin on it. I don't know if the guy is a good guy or a bad guy. I don't know what what him she he's singing for. If he is working or you know uh, working for these the big guys, if you like, or he's connected to them in any way, shape, or form, then I would have thought that he would have been taken out of the game a long time ago, instead of these people giving them their innermost secrets and telling them all, all this information. But he I, doesn't come with solutions. He comes with things that frighten people, right. and that serves the cabal very well. Well, uh, that's a kind of one thing that I found. That this is my own personal personal opinion, uh, that any time we've had him on and it comes solution time, normally at the end of the interview we generally ask the guest, you know, because some of the information is doomy and gloomy, we always uh, like to you know, get a, a solution or two at the end. And as Pastor Lindsay Williams' solution tends to be, uh, buy my book, buy my series of DVDs, and you know sometimes you could say, well, you know, throw us a bone, but he just says, you know, stock up on your stock up on your on your silver or your gold, and get your spiritual house in order. But yet the, the solutions are normally found in his book or his DVD, which I mean, I think I looked at them before, and I know Alan did too. Uh, not, not even to buy them. Uh, I'm not, sorry, I didn't look at the content. I went to look to buy them and. I think for the series of five DVDs, it was $160. You know, it's, that's way out of my price range. So, yeah, we'll check that. I will we'll check out that website as well. So, uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the link. And let me just put in a plug for my solution. My solution is do not panic. Do not fear. Look at the stakeholder analysis. We are 95% on track for rule of law. And if you want to do something, tickle your officials and tell them that when rule of law comes, you're going to remember what they did to help. Oh, yes. We, karma is a bitch. And when karma comes around and comes a-knocking, I tell you, there's a few politicians over here in Ireland that are going to get a call. That's for sure. Regardless of what excuse they come out with, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing what I'm told. It's not going to be good enough. And we've said this before on the show. We don't care whether they, what they say, whether it's 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, they're going to be held accountable. And they will still go into jail because they knew what was going on and they could come out and say it and they're not saying it for whatever reason. Well, you know, the thing is, though, I went um, to a conference by Jim Sinclair, who's a gold expert, yesterday, and I said the absolute opposite because I want things to move very, very quickly. And the the writing is on the wall. It's 95% likely that we will have rule of law. But these people are holding up the works. And that can make things very uncomfortable. So what I said to Jim Sinclair was just the opposite. I said, I'm more interested in going forward happily. And I know, I, you know, these people have to live with themselves. They have to live with their own idea. I would much rather not frighten these people and have them hold on to power and make our lives miserable. I would much rather reassure them and say, look, let's just all recognize that we're all in this together and let's all come to a solution as quickly as we possibly can. So I'm giving a different signal, but that's because I just don't want these people holding out. Yeah, but, they're frightened now. Yeah, but, I would rather reassure them and have them let go yeah, but as quickly ma- as they can. Maybe you're assuming, Karen... And I don't mean this a bad way, but maybe, maybe you're assuming that these people have empathy. If these guys are psychopaths... No, 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 no. It's not empathy. It's quite the opposite. I'm saying we are watching you now. We are giving you one last warning. And we will treat you according to this last warning. And you have a chance now. 
to redeem yourself. We're giving you a chance. Okay. It's kind of like when in the mafia you you give you know the um, the the one on the low end of the totem pole you give them the amnesty so they can squeal and get the guy at the top. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, I'd just like to say to our listeners that. The um, the the OAM stream has gone down permanently. The website's gone down for whatever reason, but we are still streaming. Yes, I told you it would happen. Yeah, I yeah, you. yeah. You did, yeah. yeah. Um, but we are still streaming on MSI Radio and United We Strike Radio, so you can actually switch over to um, them streams and you can still hear us. Plus, we have I, the. I, plus, I, you know, I think this is the biggest compliment I get. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you would. I think you're the second person that we've had on the show that um, we've uh, had problems with this. All right, and um, but we have other streams, so we don't mind. We have podcasts as well, so people will still hear it. Okay, we are. I'm just watching the time here. Do we have more quick fire questions there for Karen? There it is. He's watching the time. Uh yeah. Oh no, we we do we do we have uh, uh, questions. Karen, this one came in. This one came in there a while ago. And I don't understand the question. I'm reckon it's something to do with your side of the pond. So I'm guessing you will understand. It's uh, from one of our listeners, TRP. He wonders, what would Karen say about the existence of private exemption uh, accounts in reference to HJR192 and 31 USC 5118? If that makes any sense. It probably makes sense, but I'd have to Google it and see what it means. So maybe you can email it to me, and if there's no contact information, maybe we can put that up on on your website. I, you stumped me there. I don't know what it means. Okay, okay. well, that's fair enough. Yeah, we, well, we, we can do that. Yeah, or TRP, if you want to maybe just uh, dro- drop us a little more information. Um, what about, Karen, do you, do you ever see a time when the money will be no more? That question comes in from Tom. You know, um, on my Facebook, um, I've got a debate going about what currencies ought to look like in the future, and there's some wonderful suggestions, including, and I can't remember the name of this economist, that is talking about communities circulating local currency, and you have to pay money if you don't spend your currency by a month. You have a month to spend it. And that makes it circulate quickly, and it, it brings the economy up, the local economy. So there are all kinds. I, I think that there ought to be a lot more choice in currency. Absolutely. But um, it, if we're going to go to a system where there's absolutely no currency, that's conceivable. But we first have to get from the fiat to the value base. Yeah. And I, I think we are the currency. I think human beings are the currency. Our time and energy and what we put in is going to be the currency. Well, I think that's probably one way we could look at it. Rather than because anything that we, that if we look at a, a, a currency, regardless of what you want to call it, they can be manipulated. But if we are the currency as human beings, then you know technically we can't be uh, manipulated. And what you there put, are some there are some communities that have that approach. They have something mm. called Time bank. Yeah, we've talked about that, yeah. Time yeah, bank is, yeah. is, is, is bartering. And basically, the more, what you put in is what you get out, which I think is fair enough, you know. Steve, another question there for Karen. Yes, um, let me see. Yeah, this one. Uh, another one from TRP, actually. He has it on good authority that the Bank of Ireland is no longer listed as an active corporation in Ireland. Can Karen confirm that they, that they don't have a license to operate in this country? You know, I I read that in the um, emails that you sent me um, before the the show, but I didn't confirm it. I would, you know, and one of the one of the sad things is that information that ought to be public is not public. Yeah. And especially when it's bad news for some corporations, that's when it's really hard to find it. Well, the, the, so um, hmm. the 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 short answer to your question is, I would have to try to find out. And the long answer is I probably won't find out. Okay. Well, we have a, we have a, we're under the impression that they are trading insolvent. They don't have a – they got their banking license illegally because they lied to the central bank. And under the Constitution, people shouldn't be evicted from their homes. So there's three reasons why the banks shouldn't be in business. But yet, the government support the banks and they don't support the people of Ireland. And this is why – People are so annoyed because all the support is going for the banks and not for the people. I mean, we have literally two suicides a day, apparently, is the, the number. 
And for a population of 4.4 million, that's a lot of people committing suicide. Um, and that's, that's terrible. That is pretty bad. And that's basically, a lot of it is down to deaths. It, that, that, you know, people are, you know, oh, the, the banks are chasing people, they're losing their job. They can't pay the mortgage. I mean, we're all in the same boat. I mean, myself and Steve are no different. You owe Peter to pay Paul. I mean, we're not, we weren't not in any uh, different situation than anybody else. We're, we, we are struggling ourselves and uh, just barely hanging on like a lot of people. And this is why we need to shut down the banks and we need to, you know, sort out the banks over here and, and make a stand. But, Steve, you have another question there for Karen? Yes, indeed we do. Um, uh Again, TRP has a lot of good questions this evening. Uh, TRP, he has heard that OPEC have been exchanging oil for gold through the BIS for the past 23 years. Can you ask Karen if this is correct? Well, I, I, again, I don't know. I know the thing about the dollar is it's been um, based on the um, petroleum. That's what's kept the dollar going for so long. Um, the the former general counsel of OPEC, um, that's the petroleum, what, what does OPEC stand for? Um, anyway, that, those are the countries that, um, oil producing and exporting countries. Anyway, um, he was the, Ibrahim Shihada, he was the one who brought me into the World Bank. Um, I, it's quite possible, but um, that's not the way it's supposed to be set up. That's, uh, that agreement between the oil producing countries and the United States has been a long standing one. Um, but, you know, things do go on behind closed doors that people don't know about, and that's a possibility. Okay. Do you have any other questions there? Uh, no, was a, there's a lot, a lot of chat going on on the on the chat room there on our own chat room. Yeah. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of information coming in. And just when you when you uh, mentioned there earlier about the suicides, one of our listeners just wrote in that two of their customers have recently committed suicide. That's terrible. That's I mean it really is getting bad over here with what the banks are doing. But tell us, Karen, you apparently you've spoken to Benjamin Fulford. I have, yes. And what's your take on Benjamin and how do you feel about Benjamin? Is his information correct? Do you feel he's on their side or their side? Let me pass that question for the simple reason that I'm a lawyer. Okay. So what's your belief? <laughs> You're put there on the spot. Well, uh, Naughty boy. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, we... we we, you know, you can, we cannot be told what to believe. Well, maybe, maybe what's the word on the street? What she hear, maybe. If I, if it were complimentary, I would be in a position to say something. Oh, okay. Well, that's fair enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if in doubt, don't say anything. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Um, because um, I know you had a, had a talk with uh, Benjamin, and a lot of people follow Benjamin Fulford's um, blog, and. You know, there's arguments on both sides as to what way you take it, you know. So I was just curious because we did hear that you have a talk, you didn't have a talk with him. What's your take on the whole idea with about Switzerland and them, you know, we, 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 we have a party over here called Direct Democracy Ireland. And we had direct democracy in our constitution, which was taken out. And obviously over in Switzerland, they have direct democracy. And they, what they want to do, they've got a load of signatures there, is each citizen should be paid or each person or each sovereign person I'll get I'll get jumped on now. You're not a citizen, you're not a person, you're a sovereign sovereign individual. But each sovereign individual gets paid two thousand five hundred either dollars or whatever the currency is they're gonna pay them in um, from the government. And if you if you decide to work then it's up to you. Have you heard about that? I did read something about it. I thought Gee, maybe I should move to Switzerland. Yeah, hey, well, you'd be on the plane with us because we'd be yeah. going with you. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I will, we do have um, one of our contacts in Switzerland, Detlev, who runs Wake News Radio, and he actually lives in Switzerland. So we're going to touch base with uh, Detlev and ask him because if anybody should know about it, he, he should know about it. But, uh, yeah, the information, I have to say, Karen, the information has been fantastic, and... You know, what we are trying to do here is to go to the banks with some legal... I mean, you said it there, you might have some, some information we'll be able to get off you. And go to the banks over here and take them on and say... And go to court and go, you cannot, you know, do this because of X, Y, and Z. 
So if we had information, either from the World Bank or something that we could use, which is that we could use in court, that would be fantastic. So if you have anything along that line that we could use, maybe there's a generic document that you have regarding the banking system, and if they're not you know, applying the proper rules or regulations according to the World Bank, maybe that's something that we can get them on as well. I think you're much on much stronger ground economically when you point to the fact that people are losing confidence in the fiat currency. I think you're on perfect, perfectly um, impeccable um, ground for that. They can't give you a currency that's going to erode and crash and burn. No, definitely. Yeah. Well, they talked about the um, Amero in America, and then they talk about the bank core, which is the bank core is supposed to be the global currency. But oh, these one world currencies are just set up for the cabal. Yeah, exactly, and this is what you want to do. But as you say, with with what's happening with the cabal, they wanted a war war in Syria. They didn't get that. And there's probably a, a host of other things they're trying to do. I mean, at the moment, I know in America, you have the government shutdown, and there's loads of um, foreign troops over there at the moment. I'm not really sure what they're, what's going on there, because apparently Obama was, they, there was an attempted assassination with Obama in the Navy, you know, some Navy yard over there. And no, it wasn't an attempted assassination. Okay. What it was was the naval, and this is just hearsay, okay, but uh, the naval uh, intelligence had uncovered some things that concerned them, and the those officers that had found this information were the ones that were being shot by that sniper. Uh -huh. And there was a very um, uh, quick response from um, a, a group that's trained to respond to these kinds of um, incidents, and that group was told to stand down so that the sniper could finish executing the military intelligence that had discovered this this terrible plot. That's what I've, I've been told happened. That's terrible. It so, is terrible. So what's happening? I mean, is this rogue government taking over America at the moment? What's happening is what I told you, that the ministers of finance of the world are working together in a coalition. And, you know, I went to my county executive, and it's the counties that you know, are the, the local governments. And the counties and the sheriffs are aware that the citizens have rebuked and rescinded their consent to government in this, uh, of the federal government because yeah. of this terrible corruption. Mm. And we are not going to, you know, the same thing that happened in, in not declaring the war for Syria, we are not losing our civil rights because of the cabal trying to manipulate us. You know, they have a bunch of truckers that are coming to Washington yeah. to try to incite civil unrest. I went to that group of governors who are responsible to restore the civil um, polity if there's unrest. And I said, you're, in, you're, you're supposed to prevent unrest as well. You're not supposed to sit there and usher the citizenry into FEMA camps. What are you doing sitting on your hands when we've been reporting this corruption? Yeah, I've been writing them very strongly worded letters and putting them up on my website and uh, on the, um, the Facebook. These, these governors, and the point is, it's not just something that's going on in each individual country. All of the um, ministers of finance know that the world's currencies need immediately to be strengthened by assets and for these fiat bankers to go back where they came from. Yeah, and well, to go quickly and quietly. Well, it's going to be hard. I mean, the Rockefellers and the, the Rothschilds have been in so much control ever since the Fed came in in, uh, I believe, 1913, um, the Federal Reserve Act, and they had control of the, the money, which is a famous quote from Rothschild. I don't care who runs the country as long as I control the money. And yes, but Rothschild is the banker for the Vatican. He, yeah. he answers to the Vatican. He's subservient to the Jesuits. Okay. Yeah, and and don't forget, it was the Pope that was told to decamp because of his crimes. These are crimes against humanity. They've been convicted, and they have lost their right. And the fiat bankers ha are giving us paper that's worthless. Yeah. We're finished with them. Yeah. They are done. Definitely. They just have to figure out how to leave gracefully. 
That's what we're negotiating, how to get these people out of the way now that they have absolutely been totally um, revealed for who they are. We see them for who they are. I think of them as two-year-olds with a blanket on their head that think they're invisible. We see them. We know what they're doing. We know their tricks. They're not going to continue. They and we, just have to stop. Yeah, we, they, they have been exposed. More and more people are looking at when something happens, it's a straight away people are saying it's a false flag. You know, people are getting so so aware of what their tactics are and what they're doing, and they're getting incompetent in themselves because they're doing it in such a panic. And people just don't believe it anymore because they know That's they're right, being they're exposed. They're in a panic. That's exactly right. They are in a panic, and they deserve to be in a panic mm. because we see them for who they are. And yeah. Their time is up. Their time is up. And I mean, these people. I mean, I'd say they're probably going to be like a trapped rat in a corner, and they'll still try to fight. I can't see them going, bearing down gracefully, though. Well, that's just it. We ourselves have to help the people that don't see what's going on to see it. And we also have to start thinking about how are we going to do this transition? What's our strategy for the transition? And we should, maybe we should be offering the ones in the, in the lower echelons um, a free pass. Maybe that's what we should be doing. And let the ones at the top sit there and take the rap for what they've done. Yeah, maybe that's what we need to do. We need to start thinking about offering um, an amnesty to the, the ones on the bottom of this um, cabal. But I don't and maybe, maybe we'll get things turned around faster. Definitely. That's I, probably where we need to go. But I don't think they should be, I don't think if any member has been involved with the cabal, they should ever be allowed to be in power again. Well, I mean, we're, we're talking about the transition, and if we want things to go smoothly, we probably have to start thinking, you know, what we're prepared to offer. I think we have to start being, um, you know, talking to them. Yeah. And finding out what, what it would take to get them to relinquish their uh, stranglehold so that we can all move on. Their time is up. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to think we have, um, we'll be finishing up now, but I'd like to think in a positive way, that um, that we are winning and that they are going to back down. But we, we have one more question that's just come in there, Karen. So over to you, Steve. Yeah, Karen, this, this is going to be the last question of the evening. I'm just going to ask you because it's coming from a good friend of ours, Harry, Harry from uh, We The People. a good friend of the show. And Harry's wondering, Karen, what does sovereignty mean to you? Karen? You there, Karen? I'm thinking. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> a, good, a good response. In terms of individuals, you know, I think all of us are sovereign. I think all of us are created equal. In terms of um, immunity for countries to be immune, no, I think that's a terrible idea. The more transparency, the better. And the one platform that I have above everything else is that whistleblowers ought to, ought to feel safe. They ought to be... Um, restored to whatever it is that they've lost because that's the only way you find out what's going on behind these closed doors yeah and i totally agree with you on the t transparency side do you have a, an eta or a, a, an idea of a deadline where where are we now on the map of, of making changes i think we are just about there but i've been wrong before um the reason i think we're just about there is because um it's time for the world's gold to be restored to the world's people. And I'm getting all kinds of wonderful um, offers to sell out. So it, it means to me that I'm, I'm doing something right. Well, I definitely think you are doing something right. I think exposing what's going on. The one thing that, you know, we, we can say through our history is any secret society or group through history that has been exposed has never survived. And by you coming on the show and talking to us, and um, exposing what's gone on, I mean, we really appreciate you doing that because, you know, it, the more people know what's going on, the better. And you know, I, I suppose it's good for you, but definitely good for us because, as, as I said at the start of the show, I know you're a woman in demand and you have some great information. And we do appreciate you coming on OAM and telling us uh, what you know. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, I'm going to pass you over to Steve, and um, Steve's going to get all your details so we can let our listeners know. But thanks again, Karen, for coming on. Over to you, Steve. Karen, again, yeah, I want to echo what Alan has said. I mean, it's, it's great information. It really has been powerful stuff. 
And I mean, at at some point in the future, we'd love to kick the kick it around with you again. Uh, you know, maybe uh, I don't know, so, somewhere down the line, come come back on and we could we could we could do it again, or just get an update on on where you are. But in the meantime, can you just uh, give out your website address again? I have posted it up on the chat room there, but can you just give out your website again where people can you know, g- get more of this great information? And I know you did say there's some sample letters up there that people can have a look at too. So, yeah, just right. closing and statements. There's a contact page. It's K-A-H-U-D-E-S dot N-E-T. Okay, any, any, any final, final statements you, you, you want to make before we go? Yes. Be very um, judicious in what you believe and double-check everything. Start thinking for yourself. That's the most important thing you have to do now. Okay. Okay. And uh, there's a there's a, a last one one final 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 question has come in. It's it's uh, has to be asked. But uh, uh, Jerry is wondering: Does Karen have a six-figure bank account? And is she single? Serious question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old lady. <laughs> I don't right. think I, I don't think Jerry's. You know, I think Jerry just wants wants to know where with curiosity. But uh, <laughs> we can send on your contact details. <laughs> No, we're not a dating site. <laughs> All right, Karen, thanks a lot for coming on. Just stay with us there for a minute. We'll go over to a bit of music. We'll be back after this. Join UnitedWeStrike.com radio on the second Saturday of every month for our live international radio marathon. Don't buy, don't comply, ask why. Okay, don't buy, don't comply, ask why. A little bit of ETUK and Sick of These Wolves, and that's English Riviera Productions.co.uk if you're interested in getting a copy of that album, that CD. Uh, it is uh, absolutely brilliant, and it's, you know, it's all, all good, powerful um, you know, songs and tracks and good lyrics. And uh, while, while we're here, we're going to say a big shout out to our good friend Alan there, ETUK, who's on the chat room. So, Alan, yeah, happy. When I see you in there, I had to get one of yours lined up. I, I still listen to it in the car. Not on a daily basis, but it's still in the car. It's it's one of the few CDs that stay in the car. Well, I played a couple of his tunes last week on the United We Strike Radio Marathon, so I did say that to him. Um, okay, just a couple of things. Um, next week's guest is... Oh, yeah, we did talk about two or about that. Right, next week's guest is a guy called John Witterick, and he's the chap who set up Ghetto Death Free in the UK. GhettoDeathFree.org. So that's going to be very interesting to get John on and talking about credit cards, mortgages, banks, the whole lot, and see what John has to say about it. Um, So we'd be curious to see what he has to say. Now, something else about mobile phones. Now, for those of you that have a mobile phone, which is probably most people, if you have the mobile phone book, go and check your mobile phone book because... I was looking at a program today. Rush today was were reporting on the dangers of mobile phone signals, and they said that the mobile phone companies are beginning to put information in the mobile phone manual regarding how you should hold your phone when you're taking a call. Now this could be a get out clause because insurance companies like Lloyd's of London, who'll insure everything, do not insure mobile phone any problems with mobile phones, and it says here in my my handbook, if I can see it, I should put glasses on. Um, this device meets RF exposure guidelines in the normal use position at the rear of at least 1.5 centimeters, 5 8 of an inch away from the body. Any carry case, belt clip, or holder for body. So the, the lighting is so bad, I can't see it. It's not that the, I mean, it's printed so damn small. It's printed not to be read, in my opinion. Basically, just saying that if you have a belt on that's metallic, don't have it on. If you have a clip with your mobile phone on the side, make sure your mobile phone's away from your ear. Now, I don't know whether people realise that in the handbook, because that could be a kind of get-out clause for companies. Um, if you say you have cancer or a tumour from your mobile phone, they'll go, did you read the handbook? We've told you to keep away from your head. If I hit me nail, hit me finger with a hammer, could I? <laughs> I've never got a handbook with a hammer, so if I hit myself in the in the nail or you know, broke a finger, could I sue the makers of the hammer? Well, I'll, I'll give you something that's really, really weird. There's a guy in America who sued a drill company yeah. because he, in his infinite wisdom, his nose was itchy, so instead of using his finger, <laughs> he decided to use the drill and the drill bit, which then proceeded to take off half his face. 
And because it didn't say in the box, do you not use to scratch your nose, he wanted to sue them. And I've seen the photograph of this guy's face, which is not, oh. not very nice. So, look, you're going to get people who will buy a hammer and use it to hit somebody and then say, uh, or, or do something stupid, you know. And this is the problem with society. The people who w- like the nanny state, I was, funny enough, I was saying this to you the other day to a, a lady I know who's a very, very well trained in the driving. She went through all the driving schools and advanced driving and all that. And we were just saying that the nanny state protects the people who are, you know, the people who are really knuckle. They, they, the knuckles are going white because they're holding on to the steering wheel because they're afraid of driving. Yeah. And that's, they gauge, you know, air experience who are probably more better drivers with people like this and that's where the, the way the system's set up and it's ridiculous because well, we all have different skill sets when it comes to driving and we're not all like that but that's just the way the nanny state works but I don't know what can they say so so yeah so if you have a mobile phone manual have a look inside it it's probably under the um, product and safety information page this is a Nokia manual and it says there about keeping the mobile phone away from your head now, the other thing which we found out, and I don't know whether, I think it was Walter, or it might have been, not Walter Graham, it might have been Barry Trower, who said to us that schools, in the insurance that a school has, which is probably um, uh, just public liability insurance, that they don't cover Wi-Fi. So, if, you, if your kids are in school, and they have Wi-Fi in the school, it might be an idea to ask the head teacher, by the way, in your insurance, does that cover Wi-Fi, any danger with Wi-Fi, any damage with Wi-Fi? Chances are it won't. So if you want to get them to sign a legal document saying that they'll take personal responsibility if anything happens to your children regarding Wi-Fi, well then, you know, there you go. But um, I think it was Barry Trow that said it to us. I think it was. And, I mean, let's be honest about it. From, from what Walter told us, before about the Wi-Fi issue where he stood up, uh, stood up at meetings and he spoke to these, these executives and these heads of, of these mobile phone companies and he asked them to sign a document and uh, you know they, they all kind of, oh, no, I don't think so. They, they wouldn't do it. And I think, as he said in a previous uh, interview, that one of the head guys from one of these mobile phone companies, not only would he not sign it, but he couldn't stand over the information that was in it either because he said, look, I'm only the CEO for the company. I, I really don't know much about these things. I rely on the information that I get back from further on down the food chain. So uh, yeah. you go to the school and asking the principal to sign it. Yeah, I, I couldn't see that happening at all. No. Well, I think um, Walter told us of a case that one or two people doing that up north, which... You know, it's worth to try anyway to at least educate them, which is what I'm trying to do. But um, you know, we'll ha- have to see. We just have to make changes now. I'd like to do a just a, a big uh, well done to Claire Cullinan and debt options. There's 1,000 people taking the banks on, and the first bank to be taken on is Bank of Ireland. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, they deserve it because the amount of people that have been evicted or an attempted eviction or suicide. You know, they're just heartless corporate companies who don't give a damn about the people. And um, fair play to Claire and the team for doing what they're doing. And hopefully, you know, we, we, I don't know, we might end up on that list eventually. You know, maybe sooner rather than later the way things are going at the moment. Because, you know, um, Rob and Peter, the PayPal, is not a great way to live. And we have Christmas coming around the corner. And we have to heat our house. Because I'm, you know, you watch the food that you're eating, and you know, I mean, we're all in the same boat. I'm pretty sure we're all in the same boat, and near enough in in some kind of way. I think we are. We're all in the same boat. It's just some of us are further, you know, further towards the front end and the back end. There's probably a nautical term for that, forward and aft or something. I don't know, yeah. but you know. So I mean, when when it does capsize, some of us will drown quicker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, we have to work on it now. We've got a few minutes left now. At the start of the show, you talked about comma Ison. And I have been doing a little bit more research on, on this. You know, I know there's people out there interested, um, some people interested on the common ISIN thing, and I've been looking at it. Um, does different arguments with this. You know, number one, is it a comma or is it something else? Number two, when it reaches perihelion and goes around the sun, are we going to get hit by the actual tail of comma ISIN, or are we just going to see it in the sky? And we won't be affected by it. You know, I don't really know. NASA seems to be doctoring the images. 
and making changes. Now, if it was apparently intelligently controlled, what we've been told by some people, then why is it still on the course to go around the sun? Surely you'd kind of divert and go off somewhere else. That's my kind of query with that. So I don't really know. So we just have to see. I'm just kind of keeping an eye on what's going on. Definitely the government shut down in America. And then, I mean, that was amateur dramatics anyway. Um, the last day on the 17th. I mean, I knew that would come up and they'd get a sign off for at least three months anyway. Up to January for the, um, to increase the debt ceiling. But where is that going to go? 17 trillion, 20 trillion, 200 trillion. Where is it going to go? I don't know. So... We'll just have to see what happens in America. The power grid down now is going to be interesting in November. Um, now, if Iceland does come around, uh, by the way, I meant to say, we'll see it in the sky anyway, apparently. So we'll just have to yeah. wait and see. But, um, yes, power grid down. And then in the UK, saying about the lack of power as well. And they might have grid problems in, in the UK over the winter. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. And don't um, forget the EMPs as well. We'll have to talk about that, but obviously not this show. Yeah, with, with the EMPs. Um, a big thanks to everybody who's making donations. And if you don't have any money, just click on the adverts. If there's an advert that you like, click on the ad, and we get a few cents from that. Thanks very much for your donations. They are really, really, we really appreciate your donations. It just enables us to get to upgrade the equipment that you know for the studio here that we can make improvements. And we have... Um, purchased a few things that are due to come in to make improvements to the studio again and we just want to keep doing that to make it better um, for your listening pleasure as well and to make the get better technology we apologize for the stream problem with the OAM stream it's just one of them things that went down and you know what can we say Alan are you selling a book no but there are books on the site that you can buy um, how the banks are screwing you and what you can do that about it. That was a joke. I know. Yeah. There's a book in everybody anyway. That's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, um, you've got about 40 seconds. Well, and I need, I need to mention real quick that um, Vin is going to be on MSI later on. He's going to be talking about uh, can you get your pay, time to get the, time for a payback? That's uh, P A Y E. Anyone who's a P A Y E worker, Vin's going to be discussing that. So stay tuned to to MSI. It's going to be some good information. And also, don't forget as well, the girl against fluoride. Ashley Fitzgibbon naked calendar uh, launch at the film based Temple Bar Dublin Two. That's on November the seventh at six thirty in the PM. Okay, for myself, uh, Alan James, take care, stay safe. If you've any news, let us know. We'll uh, see you next week. Take care, bye-bye. Okay, for myself, Stephen George, uh, same, same as well. We'll see, talk to you all next week. And don't forget, if you have a rant or you want to be on the, uh, you know, the little, what's, what's the name of the little podcast? Your show. Yeah, your show again. Just uh, you know, contact us during the week. Okay, stay tuned for MSI. We'll talk to you later. Take care, bye-bye. Yeah, 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 yeah.